For full disclosure, I am the developer of the app that we use for vestibular stimulation with tone burst, and I do receive some reimbursement from the sell of the app. As far as the bone conducting headphones that we use in conjunction with the app, I have no financial interest at all in the sale or distribution of the Aftershock headphones that we recommend uh, as an adjunct to the app that we developed. So with the financial disclosure out of the way, we're going to look at some videos from our office to show you how we use the Tone Burst application, show you some of the results, and then discuss some of the, the science behind the development of the app and how you can integrate it if you so choose into your practice to help your patients with uh, balance impairments. Before we get into the application of the Tone Pacer and Tone Burst vestibular stimulation, we need to discuss some of the relevant anatomy and the circuitry that makes this application possible for the treatment of balance impairment. We're going to take a quick look at the anatomy and physiology of the vestibular system, the descending vestibular pathways, some of the ascending vestibular pathways, vestibular myogenic potentials, which are diagnostic tests that form the foundation of the use of this, this app that we developed, and some of the balance motor and central pain rehab protocols that we use with the Tone Pacer app. As mentioned earlier in this talk, we have the sensory receptors for the vestibular system in the inner ear, mainly the three semicircular canal and the two otolith organs. The semicircular canals being the anterior, the horizontal, and the posterior, and the otolith organs being the utricle and the saccule. I want you to keep in mind that the paired semicircular canals and the otolith organs work as teams or pairs across the body. As paired organs, there's a push-pull type of arrangement and the signals that they send to the central vestibular processing networks. Ultimately, the signal from these pairs, re paired receptors tells the body or gives information to the body to let the body know or the brain know if the patient is moving or if the environment is moving around the patient. We're going to try and exploit this functional connectivity of these vestibular receptors in our patients to try and improve the function of their vestibular system and ultimately improve their, their ability to balance and emulate through their environment. Okay, let's revisit our map of the semicircular canals here. As we discussed previously, the anterior and posterior canals cross the body. They're paired, the right posterior with the left anterior and left posterior with the right anterior, and the horizontal canals are paired right and left. We're going to look at some of the unique anatomy and how these structures are wired that allows us to use uh, the tone pacing device to selectively or preferentially stimulate these different canals and the otolith organs and see how they're all wired together and how we can exploit that for therapeutic purposes. Now on this slide we look at the anatomy of the inner ear, the otolith organs, the semicircular canals and pay particular attention to the vestibular nerve, cranial nerve number 8. Cranial nerve number eight is actually a combined nerve that combines the superior vestibular nerve and the inferior vestibular nerve. It's this anatomical division that forms the theoretical foundation of using tone bursts to stimulate selectively or preferentially different parts of the inner ear. As you can see from the diagram here, the superior vestibular nerve sends signals and information arising, arising from the utricle, the anterior and horizontal semicircular canals. So that forms the one portion of the sensory receptors of the inner ear. The inferior vestibular nerve sends information that is derived and generated by the saccule and the posterior semicircular canal. So I want you to remember this anatomical relationship that the saccule and the posterior semicircular canal are bundled and carry or send via, via information via the inferior vestibular nerve and the lateral canal or horizontal canals, the anterior canal and the utricle all uh, send signals on, a, on through, via the superior vestibular nerve. That anatomical separation of uh, distribution of afferents is very important to the theory of our application here. Now, signals carried by the superior and inferior and then the common vestibular nerve terminate in the vestibular nuclei 
which are located in the, the, the floor of the fourth ventricle. There are four vestibular nuclei, the superior vestibular nucleus, the lateral vestibular nucleus, the medial vestibular nucleus, and the descending vestibular nucleus. And these have important uh, descending projections that we can, in theory, uh, interface with and control and neuromodulate for the purpose of helping our patients not only with balance with but with ambulation also. The vestibular nuclei in turn send descending branches or descending pathways down as the vestibulospinal tracts and innervate the postural and structural muscles that are involved in posture and ambulation. So these nuclei and their descending pathways that are important for ambulation and balance and posture are ideal targets for us if we can somehow find an interface to modulate them in our patients with balance impairment. This pathway starts at the vestibular receptors and going to the vestibular nuclei and their descending pathways down the spinal cord as the anatomical substrate for the vestibulospinal reflex. The afferent limb of the vestibulospinal reflex is triggered by head movement and head movement in relationship to gravity. So that sends the signal into the vestibular nuclei. The effector arm of this, this reflex is uh, projected down into the spinal cord and causes postural changes through three main pathways. One is the lateral vestibulospinal tract, the second one is the medial vestibulospinal tract, and the third is the reticulospinal tract. This afferent and efferent limb of the vestibulospinal reflex is what is, allows us to respond very quickly to perturbations in posture or allows us to stabilize our posture when we're ambulating. Therefore, in theory, if we could somehow neuromodulate the vestibulospinal pathways in this reflex, we should be able to, if we can do it in, in the, the correct way, help to restore normal balance in posture and ambulation to our patients that are suffering from balance impairment. So let's take a quick look at the anatomy and the pathway of the lateral vestibulospinal tract. It descends ipsilaterally to the sensory receptors of the vestibular system. And it controls or has connections with and modulates the uh, limb muscles. It runs the entire length of the cord. So it is a powerful pathway for establishing balance and uh, stabilization during ambulation. The medial vestibulospinal tract has innervation that is bilateral, but the innervation of the descending side ipsilateral to the receptor that is stimulated is more dense. And it supplies motor control to the head, neck, and axial muscles. So again, an important tract and one that if we can manipulate and modulate should help with posture and ambulation in our patients with balance impairment. Okay, now we're going to discuss several neurophysiological tests that f form the basis of being able to use tones in the stimulation of the vestibular system for therapeutic benefit. Uh, globally, these tests are called vestibular myogenic evoked potentials, and there are two ones that are clinically used and growing in popularity test otolith function. One is the cervical VEMP and the other one is the ocular VEMP and they're related to different sensory receptors in the otolith portion of the vestibular system. So we're going to discuss studies of them and we'll build a case on how we can use these, the theory of these tests and their ability to stimulate the vestibular organs selectively or preferentially as a form of therapy for balance impairment. So this slide is very important. Let's look at it. The neural, anatomical, and behavioral evidence underpins clinical tests, meaning these evoke potentials from vestibular stimulation through the activation of otolith function in humans using sound and vibration. So in the next few slides here, we're going to look at studies that show how the otolith organs, the saccule and the utricle, can be preferentially excited and send afferent signals into the vestibular nuclei by various sounds and or vibrations. And what we're going to talk about in the end of this le lecture is how we can use bone conducting headphones to couple both the frequency that's known to activate the otolith organs and to do it through vibration of the skull as opposed to through sound waves. So let's take a quick look at how these tests are performed. 
These are evoked potential tests and are similar to any other evoked potential test where you have a stimulus which evokes or activates an action potential which is recorded from some distant structure. So these are evoked by vestibular stimulation and recorded over specific muscles for the specific tests we're going to talk about. In the case of the cervical them test, there's a stimulus given to the ear, either a loud noise, uh, air conducted or bone conducted, a, a vibration. In our diagram here you can see the green uh, symbol and the red symbol on the right ear of our little guy here and this means that we have stimulated the saccule with a 500 hertz stimuli either bone conducted or air conducted and we're recording the evoked potential from the ipsilateral SCM muscle on the neck. The ocular vamp is recorded for, uh, due to after stimulation of the utricle you see on our kind of pink color here we have a hundred hertz tone or click or vibration that preferentially stimulates the right utricle and that is recorded from the contralateral inferior extraocular muscles. And you can see the waveforms here in the white boxes. Uh, classic evoked potential testing. There's a stimulus given and a recordable evoked potential uh, at some distant target. Now, just like any other evoked potential test, like an SSEP or a motor nerve conduction study, uh, these tests are used diagnostically to show the latency and the amplitude of the signal getting through from stimulus in the sensory end organ, in this case the otolith structures, and the uh, evoked response in the case of the SCM or the uh, inferior eye muscle on the opposite side. So these are diagnostic tests that can be used to uh, test the pathways from the otolith organs uh, into the central processing areas of the vestibular network. A point I wanted to discuss here is you have your auditory evoked potential, which is the electrical activity evoked in the brain in the auditory pathways as a result of sound. If, if we would measure your scalp potentials with you listening to this lecture, we would see that the classical auditory pathways would be active and measurable evoked potentials would be occurring as a result of the auditory portion of the stimuli coming into the ear. Vestibular evoked potentials will evoke the same auditory pathways but in addition they evoke activation and pathways associated with the vestibular system. Here we see that the stimulus if it is VEMP capable will activate the anterior insula and the posterior operculum bilaterally. Those are areas of the brain that are involved with higher processing of vestibular function. So researchers have been able to tease out the activation of the brain pathways due to the sound itself and compare that to the activation in the selective, selective and preferential activation of the vestibular component of the VEMP. So in a nutshell, the take-home message is there's going to be activation in the auditory pathways, but there are also going to be specific activation associated with the vestibular pathways. Now, as we mentioned briefly, you can activate the otolith organs by vibration or air-conducted sounds of certain characteristics and certain frequencies and certain intensities. Here we see that afferent activations by both air-conducted sound and bone conducted vibration originate from the utricle macula and some from the saccular macula. The point I'm trying to build upon here and bring to your attention is that we have the possibility of activating selectively or preferentially the utricle versus the saccule in, uh, depending on the characteristic of tones that we apply to the patient. Now I want to build a little further and talk about the semicircular canals in addition to the otolith organs. In this study, the authors reported that clicks above 60 decibels, which were above the auditory brainstem evoke potential response threshold, activated both the semicircular canals and the otolith organs. In the author's report, they did single uh, unit recordings of the vestibular neurons. Uh, they showed that depending on the characteristic of the click, we could tease out possibly uh, the anterior canal, the horizontal canal, and the utricle and not uh, cause 
afferent stimulation or evoke potentials in the afferents coming from the inferior nerve or the uh, nerve associated with the saccule. The take home message from this information is that the anterior horizontal semicircular canals are kind of lengthy due to the anatomy. We talked about the, the vestibular nerve here. They're linked with the utricle and with the proper stimulus and characteristics of stimulus we can activate these semicircular canals and the utricle preferentially over the saccule and the posterior uh, semicircular canal. This concept is going to become very important when we get into the setting up the tone pacer app for treatment purposes, so keep this in mind. Now there are evidence to, that links the anterior, the horizontal, and the utricle vestibular sensory receptors with the superior vestibular nerve that we talked about the separation there. Here's another study that linked functional interactions between the saccule and the posterior semicircular canal which are, as we discussed earlier, uh, innervated or send their afferent fibers along the inferior portion of the vestibular nerve before it becomes the common vestibular nerve. So the take-home point here is that there is an anatomical separation and evidence of a functional separation based on the distribution of the inferior and superior uh, vestibular nerves and we may be able to use this anatomical and functional separation between the semicircular canals and the respective otolith organs for clinical purposes. Just to reiterate the findings of this study, these results demonstrate stimulus-dependent acoustic activation of both semicircular canals and the otolith organs. And this depends on the characteristics of the stimulus you're applying. Another very important finding presented in this study. Auditory stimulation by sound would activate the utricle and the otolith organs in a, a range between 400 and 800 hertz, whereas bone conducted vibration was uh, around 100 hertz. An important finding by the researchers was that their results suggest that the tuning is at least in part due to the, the inherent properties of the sensory receptor. They suggest that a 100 hertz bone conducted tone is specific for utricle stimulation based on the structure and the function of the utricle, the anatomical structure of it. Now, as we just discussed a few slides ago, we have your cervical vestibular evoked myogenic potential test. In that test, we stimulate the saccule and record from the ipsilateral SCM. And in this study, they found that when a short term tone burst was applied, the reactive optimal frequency for the myogenic potential was relatively low, between 500 and 1000 hertz. Taken together, we see that a 100 hertz stimulus is preferential for the, the utricle, and a 500 hertz stimulus is preferential for the saccule. So then, at least in theory, we have the opportunity to manipulate the utricle and its associated semicircular canals and the uh, saccule and its posterior semicircular canal by manipulating the frequency of tones and the ear we apply the tone to. This forms the basis for a treatment we call tone burst vestibular stimulation. So here's a quick summary of the research on the effects of tones on the vestibular system. We have a 100 hertz tone which is preferential for the utricle plus the anterior canal plus the horizontal canal via the superior vestibular nerve. And we have 500 hertz tones which preferentially activate the saccule plus the posterior canal via the inferior vestibular nerve. And all these tones uh, activate a wide area of the cortex that are, is related to vestibular function. Okay, so let's take a look at the app we developed to manipulate tones and manipulate the vestibular system based on tones. In the interest of full disclosure, I do make profit from the cell of this app. I do not make profit from the bone conducting headphones that we use. We recommend aftershock headphones. The name of the app is called Tone Pacer. It's a pretty basic design. It has a pause play button, a fix versus random metronome type function, and a digital timer. 
So our theory based on the research that we just decided is that the vestibular nuclei are receiving action potentials from the superior vestibular nerve. We'll interpret that afferent signal as coming from the utricle, horizontal, or anterior semicircular canals ipsilateral to its source. The vestibular nuclei are receiving action potentials from the inferior vestibular nerve. We'll interpret that afferent signal as coming from the saccule and or the posterior semicircular canal ipsilateral to its source. So the obvious other controls would be to stimulate selectively the utricle, the saccule, or both with the buttons on the app and we also control the beeps per minute uh, when it's in fixed inter interval mode. The final group of controls allow you to, to stimulate the left ear only, both ears, the right ear only, random left, right, or both, and reciprocating mode where it goes between left and right and right to left. So going back to the clinical concept of canals pairs working in pairs and having a push-pull effect, if clinically we determine our patient has a right posterior semicircular canal deficit and or a left anterior canal deficit, we can stimulate those canals preferentially or at least have the central portion of the vestibular system believe that we are s selectively stimulating those canals by putting a 500 hertz tone on the right posterior canal and a 100 hertz tone on the left anterior canal. This being accomplished by setting up the parameters on our app. And of course if clinically we find the opposite canals are dysfunctional we can set up the parameters of the app to preferentially activate the canals in such a way that would strengthen the signal and normalize and modulate the input into the central vestibular system based on the tones we select. Thank you for your attention. I hope this uh, lecture provided some useful information. We're going to conclude with a short video showing how we determine the side of stimulation or the canal pair deficits and also one more uh, video, Vigenet, of uh, the response, the immediate response in a patient with uh, some vestibulopathy. So once again, thank you for allowing me to present this to your group. That's when I'm wobbly, that's when I got my eyes closed. Okay, turn your head to this side and tilt your ear down to the chest here. Okay, turn your head towards me, tilt your ear down to this side. That's, that's your bad one, right? Yeah. Okay. Look, open your eyes a second. Look up at the ceiling over this shoulder for me. Try and tilt your head back a little bit and close your eyes. Kind of tough? Yeah, very tough. All right. Uh, open your eyes. You can lean against okay. the wall. You okay? Yeah. So that was... Quick. You hear that beep and it should be yeah. in both ears. I do. I'm gonna have you. Can you just hold on to that? Come away from the wall. Put your feet together. And close your eyes. See how you feel. How do you feel? A little more steady. Okay, now turn your head towards me and tilt your ear down this way. Yeah, look, right. look the other way. This way. Hang in there, see if you balance. Feel more steady? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Open your eyes a second. Now look over the, your shoulder up this way. And then close your eyes. Hang in there till you find your center. How's, huh? that, how's that feel? That feels better. Okay. Yeah. Can you stand a little bit away from the wall? Oh yeah, sorry. All right. I'm like all, I want to get comfortable there. Sure. Now, can you close your eyes? Okay. Okay. You can hold on to the wall until I get you hooked up here. Okay. You're falling to your left, correct? Mm-hmm.
this is going to be like just a beeping in your ear. ear. Okay. And we'll see if we can feel that. Feel that? Yeah. Okay. See if that helps you or hurts you. How do you feel with that? Feels kind of cool. I feel more relaxed. Okay. Or I felt like my muscles were vibrating. That's what it felt like. Okay, close your eyes. Okay. Let's see, go back. I'm going to play in both ears now. Okay. I'm going to speed up the tempo a little bit. You okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, close your eyes. Open your eyes. Feel That's a little bit cool. more stable? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to stop it for a second. Okay. Okay, close your eyes again. Go right over. I'm trying to find it. Okay, open your eyes. <laughs> jerking me to the left or something when I do that. Okay, try and close your eyes. What do you think? I'm a little more centered for sure. For sure, okay. I don't feel like I'm being jerked. Okay. Like I feel like I'm being jerked the otherwise. Okay, so how, tell me how you feel, Mel. Uh, I feel much steadier. I don't wobbling when I'm walking. I'm just well. All right, like come walking. on towards me. Yeah, very I'm good. To be walking. Excellent. How long have you been dizzy like this? A couple of five, five years. Okay.